Funding for Shape Realis is provided by Surfshark VPN, the sponsor of today's video. 2022 was the year that Sonic Frontiers came out, and I played it, and it was pretty good, and that's about it. It's getting harder and harder to justify carrying on the tradition of opening these yearly ranking videos by talking about whatever Sonic did. What other things happened? Uh, I got hyper fixated on Mario Kart this year thanks to the booster course pass, and to the point where I made two Mario Kart videos, with like, seven more to go in 2023. Xenoblade 3 was cool. I played like 30 hours of it and then got stuck on some random mini boss and said, okay, time to move on, I guess. I'll beat it eventually, maybe, probably, I don't know. New Jackbox was pretty fun, and my friends and I definitely got the most mileage out of Rumorang. It's a game where you can pretend to be fictional characters and answer questions how they would answer them. What's not to love? I want to die, so I'm going home. Regional manager. He works for the IRS. Ye girl. The Cuphead DLC was fantastic and well worth the wait. Spider Hack is a game where you play as spiders and you try and kill your friends with guns and lightsabers. So, 10 out of 10, obviously. Please play it. Cute cat game was very fun, but it ended super abruptly, which was kind of weird. I don't mind short game lengths, but it just didn't feel like this is where the story or the world of the game should have concluded. I don't know. Oh well, still good stuff. I haven't played God of War Ragnarok yet, which is good, because you can pretend that would be number one on my list if I had played it. Therefore, I have pleased all God of War fans without doing anything. Uh, I did play Shin-chan, Me and the Professor on Summer Vacation, The Endless Seven Day Journey, though. Alright, enough dawdling. Here's my top 10 games of 2022. Go play them, cuz they're epic. Let's go! Fire Emblem Warriors 3 Hops. I forgot this came out this year. These Warriors games have always been hit or miss for me whether I'll like them or not. I loved the original Hyrule Warriors, but couldn't really get into Age of Calamity, Persona 5 Strikers, and especially the OG Fire Emblem Warriors. The gameplay got real old real fast for me with the latter three games, but for some reason it really clicked with me here. For the most part, I started getting a little antsy waiting for the game to wrap up by the end. But at least 80% of the time, I was having fun here. I think credit mainly goes to how expertly they translated the Three Houses experience into warrior-style combat. It really does feel like I'm playing more Three Houses, just with beat-em-up gameplay instead of chess. The world of Fodlin feels expanded upon, with a ton of characters we've heard about but never met before here in person for the first time. Like Hilda's brother, who's voiced by Pro ZD. God damn it, Grandma, I'm trying to go viral! It's satisfying as ever to rank up the bonds between units and see their delightful support combos, as well as strategically deploying them to different spots on the battlefield. Just like a regular Fire Emblem, except here, you can personally wreck shit up as Raphael or Bernie or the great Lawrence Hellman Gloucester. Yeah, I I probably wouldn't love this game that much if I wasn't already super invested in these characters, but it's absolutely a must play if you're obsessed with these kooky goofballs like I am. Also, I only played the Golden Deer route, but I'll get to the other routes eventually. Maybe. Ah, who cares? Fear the deer, motherfucker. Melatonin is the best rhythm having game on the Switch. I love when indie developers step up and make something that stands toe to toe with a dormant series from a big corporation, while also having a unique identity and standing on its own. And Melatonin certainly does. The gorgeous pink and purple color palette, the creative level themes, and the sheer satisfaction of nailing the timing on the game's many rhythm based challenges is an absolute treat. Definitely don't miss out on this one if you're a rhythm game fan. Okay, this is really embarrassing to admit, but I actually really liked the Pokemon games this year. I feel like there's a lot less shame in putting Legends Arceus here. Aside from its graphical shortcomings and boring ass story, it's a really solid time. Catching Pokemon without having to initiate a battle is immensely satisfying, and I love exploring these areas and seeing what there is to find. It's a huge step in the right direction for Pokemon, and I'd love to see more Legends games in the future. Now, Pokemon Violet, that's much more of a guilty pleasure. It's blatantly obvious that they were rushed out and unfinished. Though, to be honest, the insane glitches and laughably bad frame rate in a ton of areas is kinda charming in its own way. Like, this is the state of the highest grossing media franchise on the planet? That's funny. But the crazy thing is, beneath its crusty and unfinished exterior lies a really fun and engaging open world Pokemon game. This is exactly the direction the franchise should have gone for years now, and I had so much fun with it that a finished version of this game probably could have topped my best of 2023 list. Both of these games could have been truly amazing if they had more time in the oven, but 
I'm not gonna lie and say that I didn't have a ton of fun with them, as is. I thoroughly enjoyed a mainline Pokemon game for the first time since Gen 5. Give me a medal or something, I definitely earned it. LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga has been one of my most anticipated games for years. I'm sure you know just how much I love the complete saga, and so I couldn't wait for this true evolution of the LEGO Star Wars franchise. I played through it and loved it on my first go-round, but over time the cracks have been starting to show with this one. There's a lot of boring trailing missions, and the levels don't really live up to how they were in Complete Saga, and the ship battle side quests are very repetitive and kinda suck, and glitches are abundant, and the UI's terrible, and and some of the cutscenes awkwardly speed through verbatim dialogue from the original movies, and the character class system leads to a lot of repetition with how certain characters play, and the lack of voice lines for the DLC characters is pathetic, and Yoda's death sound is way worse than it was in the original. <laughs> It's very flawed, but at the same time, I can't deny just how much fun I had with it. The fan service is on point. They basically took any obscure character from the movies you could ask for and plopped them into this game. On top of including basically every meme line the franchise has ever had in some capacity. The voice cast is really solid. Hearing the Clone Wars actors again is absolutely wonderful. They all nail it as usual. And the sound alikes for the original and sequel trilogies do a great job as well. I really came to love the Kylo Ren actor especially. He sounds nothing like Adam Driver, but then again, Matt Lanter as Anakin sounds nothing like Hayden Christensen. Once I accepted that this was an alternate take on the character, I really came to love the way Kylo's lines were delivered. And exploring these planets is so satisfying, especially in co-op. We've basically got an entire open world Star Wars game at our disposal, and I could get lost in exploring Coruscant, Tatooine, Naboo, Canto Bight, Exegol, Octo, etc. for hours. Once again, Again, the game serves as a great equalizer for the franchise, getting a ton of fun aspects out of the bad Star Wars movies as much as the good ones. I mean, Funky Snoke? Come on, that's incredible. Sorry, I've been going on for too long. Uh, yeah, this is a good game. It's just hard to say if it's a great one, since it does have a lot holding it back, and I do think I still prefer the complete saga overall. I don't know, I'm currently playing it with Chris over on the Schaeferless Gaming Channel, Space Chris 7 hashtag subscribe. So maybe after this new playthrough, I'll have enough to say for a full video on it. I don't know, we'll see. Number six. Lunastis is an immensely satisfying bite-sized 3D platformer that you can get for the low, low price of $5. <laughs> We got a deal. Between the tightly designed levels and the gorgeous Sega Saturn-esque graphics, I had such a blast with this incredibly fun game that after beating it, I immediately went back to beat it again a second and third time. Also, this was just developed by one person. Imagine being this talented, like wow. Seriously, give this game your $5. $5. It deserves it so much. And you know what else deserves your money? Surfshark VPN. An incredible product that encrypts your data and protects you online. Surfshark VPN allows you to access geo-restricted content, meaning you can trick your browser into thinking you're in another country, thus allowing you to access content you couldn't get otherwise. That way you don't have to physically travel to another country to watch that country's exclusive Netflix or Disney Plus content, for example. If Disney ever makes a LEGO Star Wars special exclusive to French people for some reason, use Surfshark to pretend you're French. Then you can enjoy all the wacky misadventures of General Grievous. <laughs> You can also use Surfshark and its Surfshark alert system to get alerts anytime your email address or password is compromised. Surfshark alert scans various databases of leaked information and notifies its users if their data is found so they can take action, which is an absolutely invaluable feature. Surfshark is also totally unlimited, meaning you can use it on as many devices as you like, even all at the same time. No other VPN allows this. Go to surfshark.deal slash realist and enter promo code realist to get 83% off and 3 extra months of Surfshark VPN for free. It's an amazing deal, and it's even better because it comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not satisfied, you can cancel during those 30 days and get your money back. If you're looking for a great VPN, there's no reason not to give Surfshark a try. Once again, head to surfshark.deal slash realist and enter the promo code realist. Have a great time with Surfshark VPN. Spoon 3. This one mainly gets points for having the best single player in the series so far. Merging the best aspects of the campaigns from the first two games and Octo Expansion into one glorious, tricky, super fun package. The final boss battle? Now nah, that's some good shit. Other than that, it's good old Splatoon that we all know and love, with a lot of little refinements that make this the best version of just about every one of the franchise's classic modes. Like, I love the addition of a second checkpoint in Rainmaker, which adds a ton more strategy 
and makes it so you can't just charge in and end a match within 15 seconds. Or the fact that they lowered the clams needed for a football from 10 to 8 in Clam Blitz. Also, I'm curious why everyone hates this mode. I, I genuinely don't get it. It's perfectly fine. There are some problems. Like, as cool as the King Salmonoid addition is to Salmon Run, the rewards you get from beating him are not well balanced or thought out at all. <laughs> And perhaps most disappointingly, at this point in time, they really messed up the Splatfests. The unique stages from 2 are gone and replaced with these tricolor matches that are so unbalanced and unfun for the defending team that Nintendo practically removed them entirely from rotation. I can't remember the last time I actually got one, and this was supposed to be the main hook of Splatoon 3 Splatfests. What used to be my favorite part of the Splatoon experience is now something I couldn't care less about. But then again, this game does have Big Man, so I guess that balances things out. Tinykin is kind of like Pikmin, but I promise there's other reasons why I like it. It is a very different experience. You do command a bunch of little critters, but instead of being about real-time strategy, it's more of a 3D collectathon where you explore and platform through vast environments themed around rooms in a regular house. The game is insanely well polished with so many cool things to discover, and I had an absolute blast with it from beginning to end. Honestly, my biggest problem with the game is just the fact that I don't like the main character's yee-yee ass haircut. Everything else about this game is excellent. Go play it. <laughs> Little Gator Game is one of the cutest games on the whole planet. Basically, the premise is that you're a kid who's bored waiting for the next Zelda game to come out, so you basically make your own Zelda adventure IRL. That's adorable, and you can see the influences of Breath of the Wild as they would be recreated by a little kid everywhere. There's a big shirt he uses for a paraglider, a shield he uses to surf on, a pointy hat, a sword, the works. Exploring this island, making friends, and slaying cardboard enemies is an absolute blast. Plus, there's so many alternate swords, shields, and hats to collect. You can get a laser sword, which the game describes as a fine addition to your collection. You can get a skateboard and become Little Gator, Pro Skater. You can get bubble gum, which allows you to fly anywhere via this bubble you blow. You can get a ninja headband, which changes your walking animation into a Naruto run. Have I mentioned yet that this game is the most precious thing ever created? The story is surprisingly emotional, and the writing evokes so much childlike wonder and whimsy. I had a huge smile on my face from beginning to end when I played this. It's another game that's very short, but I enjoyed it the whole way through and would highly recommend it. I wish there was an in-game map, but that's my only real issue. Otherwise, it's pretty perfect for what it is. Definitely check it out. And here we are, Kirby and the Forgore Land. It took forever for the Pink Puffball to make his 3D debut, but man was it worth the wait. This is easily up there as one of the best Kirby games, if not the best. The new powers and upgradable abilities are imaginative, the levels are creative, the graphics are gorgeous, the bosses are fun, the inexplicable horrific shit in the endgame is top tier as far as inexplicable horrific shit in a Kirby endgame goes. It's a game that just never ceases to bring me joy throughout my entire 100% playthrough of it. Which, may I add that 100% in a game is something I rarely do anymore. I don't have free time, I beat a game, then that's it. I gotta move on to the next one and not dilly-dally. I didn't even 100% my number one game of the year. Though, once you see what it is, I'm sure you'll understand why. But Kerbo is so consistently engaging and fun that I just had to complete every last challenge and see everything it had to offer. And I'm so satisfied that I did. It was a tremendous burst of joy from start to finish, and you definitely shouldn't miss out on it. At least listen to Roar of DDD, because that's one of the hardest tracks I've ever heard in any video game. <laughs> My number one game of 2022 was... The Switch port of Persona 5 Royal, baby! That definitely counts as a brand new game. Just look at the new button prompts and the new graphic for the dark controls. That technically counts as new Persona 5 content. And that makes this a new game! See? See? No, no, but for real though, number one is Elden Ring. Finally, a game of the year winner I can entirely get behind. For me, this pretty much lived up to all the hype, and I had a phenomenal time with it. This is the first Souls-like title I've ever played, and I'm completely in love. It's so satisfying to be presented with bosses this hard, that curb stomp you dozens of times before you finally learn to dodge their attacks, sufficiently level up, maybe cheese the fight with a couple spirits, yes I'm that kind of player, and eventually annihilate your foe. The sheer joy and relief I felt after finally beating Margaret the Fell Ogre cannot be 
overstated. And that was just the first boss. Little did I know that I was in for so many more toils and hardships as the game progressed. But the sheer satisfaction of getting better and better, both in terms of my stats and my playstyle, was more than enough to hook me. And that's not even mentioning how incredible this world was to explore. Despite loving Zelda more than any other franchise on the planet, I think this is the first game I've played that truly exceeds the open world of Breath of the Wild. So many landmarks and hidden areas to discover, and coming across cool shit in the overworld was just as enthralling as beating the bosses. I'll never forget the awe I felt upon discovering Nakron for the first time, or how cool it was to explore the Raya Lucaria Academy. I think that's how that's pronounced. <laughs> this is a game that really captured my imagination, where I was dying to see what I'd discover next, and where my discoveries constantly surprised me with how much they expanded the scope of the world. Overall, despite this game not being for everyone, since it is hard as balls, I highly recommend it, since it really is as good as what you've been hearing about it. Anyway, that's about it. I'm not playing any more games until Pikmin 4 comes out, so wake me up when that happens. Good night, Tri-State Area.